In this uh, short video, I'm going to demonstrate the use of a stem and leaf plot. Now, a stem and leaf plot is really a tool that allows us to take sample data and then uh, organize it in a fashion that shows us a bit about the shape of that data, but also it allows us to see the original values that were in that data set. What we do is we take a number, let's say 24. Let's just... Uh, 24, and we will split it into two parts, and we'll say, let this be the leaf, and let this be the stem. So the tens would be the stems, and then the uh, units would be the leaf. And then if we organize it like that, we will see the shape. So let me just show you very quickly. So we have uh, before and after, uh, where an insurance company is just basically trying to lower the age of its policyholders, so it's decided to embark on a marketing campaign to recruit new people, and it wants to see whether or not uh, it was successful in, in accomplishing that. So we have the, average, the age of a random sample of clients before the program and a random sample of the new recruits or new clients for the company. So I'm going to do before right here. And what we do is we just take a straight line to separate the stems from the leaves. Look at the values uh, in, the, in the sample set and then find the smallest value and then the largest value. Smallest value looks like 25. Largest value looks like it is 64. So that means that the smallest stem will be 2 and the largest stem will be 6. So I would simply write 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We would then take the leaves and write them on the same line as the corresponding stem. So I have, for the 20s, if I'm looking at the uh, 20s, as I go through, oh, rather than do that, well, I could just kind of do the numbers as they come. So 33, 44, 54, 40, 40, 39, 55, 36, 62, 58, 64, 56, and 48. Okay, so we have now all the, the values, and it's always good to count just to make sure you have the correct number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we do have 20 values right there. And look at the interesting thing. If I were to draw a little block around this, it starts to look like a histogram. Isn't that cool? And then I could begin to see what the shape might look like. All right, kind of almost looks symmetrical. Let's do the second one after and see if the shape looks any different. So that's what it allows us to do, is to do a nice little comparison between those two. It looks like the smallest number is in the 20s and the largest number is in the 40s. So our stem will go 2, 3, 4. We don't have that many stems, same number, same number of numbers, but let's look at that. So 23, 31, 40, 28, 26, 34, 40, 28, 25, 29, 35, 24, 42, 32, 30, 28, 39, 44, 27. Interesting. And then as we look at this data, we notice that the shape is different. It almost looks like it is slightly skewed. Right? So one seems to be slightly more symmetrical than the other, but clearly the range is different for the two, between 25 and 64, versus 23 and 44. 
and um, we see that the shapes are slightly different. So that's a stem and leaf plot, which is quite you know a, a useful tool to summarize data and allows us to see um, the original values. One of the beauty, um, one one of the useful things that we can do with this data, is that um, uh, we could now order the leaves and create what we call an ordered plot. And if so, for example, if I were to order the leaves uh, for before on in the thirties, I have three four four eight zero six, so it should then become three four four. But then the zero has to go before the three, so I would then need to order it. Let's see if I can move that a little bit. I'm going to just show you how we could just order the plot. And that would be useful because then we could use it in calculating the median and the, the quartiles where we require ordered data. So an ordered plot will look like this. Two, three, four, five, six. So five and nine are okay. But then I would need zero. I need four. No, sorry, zero three. Zero three four four six eight. Now that's the order. And then I would go with the forties, the numbers in the forties. I go forty, forty two, forty four, forty five, and then forty eight. And then we would have on the fifties we would have two five six eight two five six eight and then we would have o oh, two four so same shape but now the numbers are ordered so if i was looking for the median um the median we know is a um, middle number but because we have an even set of numbers which is 20 the median would be between the 10th and the 11th values so all i now need to do is to count up from the 5, 9, the 0, the 3, the 4, the 4. So if I just count up to the 10th and the 11th values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is my 10th value. This is my 11th value. So hence, the median is in between those two. So my median would be x10 plus x11 over 2, which is 42. Plus 42. So 42 plus 44 over 2, which is 43. All right? And then if we want quartiles, which would be 5.25, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we'd be somewhere in between here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's 15. We would be somewhere in between here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. For our third quartile. So Q3 is somewhere in here. Q1 is right here. And we could do the appropriate calculations to get them. Point I'm just trying to show you here is that we are using a stem and leaf plot. We could organize the data very quickly. And then we order the leaves. Then we have an ordered stem and leaf plot, which we can use uh, to to um, help us uh, with what we need to do in calculating median, quartiles, percentiles, and so forth. Now let's take a look at the concept of the empirical rule. The empirical rule, let me just write that down. So the empirical rule is a is um, an observation in, in statistics which basically says the following. If we take a sample and we believe that that sample is from a normal population, then that sample should exhibit some characteristics of that normal population. Well, one particular characteristic is that there is a certain percentage of the area under the normal curve that exists between one standard deviation from the mean, two standard deviations from the mean, and three standard deviations from the mean. If the sample, we believe, comes from that uh, a normal population, then we should see a similar pattern where within one standard deviation of the sample mean, we should see approximately the same uh, proportion of values. Two standard deviations and three standard deviations. So that, those proportions are 68%, 95%, and pretty much almost everything, which is 99.75%. Uh, okay? So we're going to demonstrate how you actually 
do the empirical rule. But just to kind of um, paint the picture and make it clear for you, let me just uh, do a little scribble here. Uh, so if this were our normal population, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one standard deviation from the mean, two standard deviations from the mean, and three standard deviations from the mean. So population mean is mu, standard deviation is sigma. So this first uh, one here is mu plus sigma, mu minus sigma. Second one, mu plus two sigma, to mu minus two sigma. And the third one, mu minus three sigma to mu plus three sigma. So I'm kind of like writing them on the outside so you could get a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, here and here. So let's just shade those differently. So in the red area, that's within one standard deviation from the mean, we're expecting about 68% of all of the values in that distribution to be in that range. Let's take the blue area now for two standard deviations. So I gotta go across, I gotta include here, make sure I include that. And that would be about 95%, approximately 95%. And then three standard deviations, let's get to green. See how that looks. So we are we're looking at all of this right here, included. So for three standard deviations, all right, we now want pretty much everything. So 99.75% is what we're looking at. So just about everything is in there. So what we're saying is that if a sample comes from the normal population, it should have a similar pattern, except that everywhere we have X bar, not x bar, everywhere we have mu, we would use x bar. And everywhere we have sigma, we would use s. So what we are doing is pretending that the sample, uh, that, the, that, the, that the mean is actually x bar and that the standard deviation is s. And if we did that and say, okay, fine, let's take one standard deviation from the mean, two standard deviations from the mean, and three standard deviations from the mean, then we should see the same kind of pattern. All right? That should be 68%. If we take x bar plus s, x bar minus s, then we go x bar plus 2s, and then x bar minus 2s. Well, that should be my blue region right there, I guess. Let me get back to blue. just like the population. So that should be 95%. And then last but not least, the green region should be all of that. So if we include all of this, that should then be 99.75%. Um, I, I run out of space here a little bit. So you get the point that if we go from population to sample, the sample should have the same characteristics of the population. Now let's demonstrate this by creating some space here and working this uh, sample problem that we have here. So First thing we will need to do is to calculate the sample mean and sample standard deviation for this data. And you know how to do that already, which is x bar is equal to the sum of x over n, and that s is equal to the square root of the sum of x squared minus the sum of x, all squared over n, divided by n minus 1. So that is how we calculate that. When you substitute the values that you have, we gave you the sum of the x's, is equal to 672.38, and the sum of the x squares is 20,517.77. So just substitute those values in there and calculate the sample mean. Turns out the sample mean is 28.02, and the sample standard deviation is 8.55. What we need to do now is to take this data, this is 
x bar. Take this data and compute x bar plus or minus s, x bar plus or minus 2s, and x bar plus or minus 3s. We just need to compute that. When we compute those values, we will count within each of the ranges or each of the intervals how many values actually fall in that range. So let's do that by creating a little table. So we'll see here's the interval that we're interested in. Here's the lower limit. Here's the upper limit. Okay. And uh, the percentage uh, that we get of the data that's in there. So for x bar plus or minus s, the lower limit turns out to be, and I just sort of do one calculation so you could see how we would do this, which is basically 28.02 minus 8.55, which gives us 19.47. All right, upper limit, we would do same thing, 28.02 plus 8.55, and that would give us 36.57. So now if we count, if we count how many values are between 19.47 and 36.57, it turns out we get 16 values. 16 values over 24, and that gives us 66.67%, two-thirds of the data is in that range. I'm going to try to make this fit a little better. 66.67%, not quite. Okay. There we go. So that's the first range. And then so we will continue with x bar plus or minus 2s. And we will get the following ranges. 10.92 to 45.12. 45.12. And it turns out there are 23 out of 24 values in there, which gives us 95.38%. And then last but not least, x bar plus or minus 3s gives us uh, the following values, 2.37 to 53.67. And all of the values, 24 to 24, is in that range, which is 100%. Okay? So, if you look at the ranges now, of 66.67, and 100%. I think it's fair to say that this is pretty close to 68%, 95%, and 99.75%. So I would argue that that data came from a normal population. I have no fear of, um, of making that conclusion. But remember what we said, it's an empirical rule. So... If we believe it came from a normal population, we should see similar pattern of behavior. I think that this pattern of behavior is similar enough. And so therefore, I would say we have some evidence that this data came from a normal population. So that is the application of the empirical rule. Now, what does that allow you to do? Well, it allows you to make the assumption that the, the, normal, that the population is normal. Therefore, the sampling distribution is also normal. So that's a useful uh, extrapolation that we can uh, make by having shown that the sample data seem to be consistent with the empirical rule.